Hi everyone, my name is Darwin Millard, aka the Spock of Cannabis. I'm the Chief Science Officer for Final Bell, and I'm super excited today to talk about uh, ASTM International's Technical Committee D37 on Cannabis and how these standards uh, can benefit the marketplace. Curious About Cannabis is dedicated to providing reliable cannabis science education to anyone curious enough to learn. To get access to free courses and other educational resources, visit learn.cacpodcast.com and become a Curious About Cannabis member for free. The Curious About Cannabis book provides an incredible crash course in cannabis science through over 500 pages of content filled with photos, activities, science experiments, games, and more to help guide you through your personalized cannabis education journey. This book has become a trusted textbook in colleges and universities across North America and is absolutely perfect for serious learners as well as cannabis educators, bud tenders, clinicians, patients, and caregivers. And special thanks to the many individuals, companies, and organizations that have helped Curious About Cannabis meet our mission of becoming the number one trusted source of cannabis science education on the planet. This includes organizations like Credo Science with Ethan Russo, The Conigma, Treadwell Farms, The Spellman Report with Kevin Spellman, The Workshop, Green Earth Medicinals, CBD National, Magnolia Botanicals, and more. Visit cacpodcast.com slash sponsors to learn about our sponsors and go show them some love for helping us spread cannabis science education far and wide to anyone curious enough to learn. If you like Curious About Cannabis, consider checking out some of these other learning initiatives by Natural Learning Enterprises. Come on, Molly! It'll be an adventure! Phoebe called out as she followed Brother Toadstool. Brother Toadstool led Phoebe and Molly into a tunnel that went deep down into the ground. As they climbed into the tunnel, they found themselves getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Our new children's book, A Toadstool's Treasures, takes young readers on an adventure into the fun and fascinating world of fungi. Learn more and find mycology-related learning resources, games, and lesson plans for teachers and homeschooling families at toadstoolstreasures.com. And now, back to the show. Hey everybody, this is Jason with Curious About Cannabis. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Today I'm really excited to be sitting down with a fellow quality systems nerd like myself. I'm here with the Spock of Cannabis, Darwin Millard. Darwin, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast today. I'm really stoked to connect with you. Absolutely, Jason. Me too. So one thing I wanted to talk about today, and this may end up leading into a series of conversations because we have a lot to get through in a short amount of time to start to unpack it. But, you know, my background working in analytical labs ended up revolving a lot around quality systems, trying to understand how we defend the data that we're producing, um, both to ourselves as well as like legally, um, as well as trying to understand how to produce data that can be used by the public and other researchers and things like that um, in a way where the data is validated and everything. So I come from a background where I understand the importance of standardization and, and quality, but I think to a lot of other people, standardization and compliance and all of that sort of stuff sounds like a lot of paperwork and check boxes and you know like the 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 sort of these kind of hurdles that you have to overcome in order to um, do business and I'm hoping that through this conversation we can change that perspective a little bit because I actually do believe that these standards um, all of these things that we're going to talk about today actually add value to producers and also add value to consumers as well. And I'm, I'm really hoping that we can overcome this kind of psychological hurdle a lot of people have about just the word standardization and, and all, you know, kind of what that means. So, 
you know, that's kind of where I'm coming at this conversation. So do you mind um, Great. unpacking a little bit? How did, how did you get involved in the world of standards? And then we'll kind of um, um, spin off from there. That, great question, Jason. Yeah. So, I mean, um, well, for me, it was, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So yeah. I kind of understand standards, I guess, from a foundational standpoint. And then hearing in 2017 that ASTM International, which is a you know a 125 year old now uh, standards development organization, that they were creating a uh, legitimate you know cannabis committee to create standards uh, as a consumer of cannabis products uh, and an engineer working in the cannabis industry, I was like, ooh, uh, no brainer! I need to join this uh, yeah. standards development committee. And you know, I guess like from day one, I guess I drank the Kool-Aid. So I've been, I've been in it deep now uh, since the very first meeting, which was in June of 2017. So it's like five yeah. years later now. Um, and I guess you know, like for me, again, as a mechanical engineer and consumer coming at uh, operating within the cannabis, which, you know, both marijuana and hemp space, right? There isn't a lot yeah. of, as you were mentioning, data. Uh, and fundamentally, what got me started is making sure that I knew what my cost of goods were. So as a producer, right, I could make sure I was making money. Yep. Absolutely. And um, so go, that goes back pretty far because I'm, I'm trying to think of what I was doing in 2016, 2017. That was when I was knee deep in analytical testing compliance stuff back in Oregon, um, right after legalization. And yeah, there, at that time when I was working on building a lab, there really, there were no standards, no standards at all. Um, and there was only these early, early discussions of like, we probably need to start, you know, deciding what terminology we're using in this industry and what sort of quality um, standards are needed. So you've really been there at since the very beginning of really these these formal conversations by these organizations that normally you know develop these standards in other industries. You were really right there at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, uh, at that you know very first meeting, uh, it's kind of funny. I was uh, you know. Uh, someone who was like, we should remove hemp from our lexicon as like one of the first motions that I uh, uh, opened on <laughs> right. the floor uh, because, you know, I was uh, the, the whole misnomer between marijuana, hemp and everything right. like it's all that. Cannabis. And yeah, exactly. Kind of thing was, uh, I think was like fundamental that I was trying to get across to everybody in the beginning of the standards development process. But, you know, again, as a avid producer of products, when, uh, and it's all volunteer driven, right? So all this yeah. work over the last five years, the the growth of our committee, which has been amazing. Uh, we're at like 1,400 volunteer members now, which is wow, one of ASTM wow. International's largest subcommittees, right? And like, you've got to understand again, 125 years of standards development history. Uh, there's got to be tons of other technical committees, which there are. There's nearly 100 other yes, technical yeah. committees. Oil and gas, for instance, right, is one where if you're going to sell crude or uh, refined petroleum anywhere in the world, you're using an ASTM standard, right? Like that's kind yeah. of the big deal here. So uh, when I uh, had an opportunity to volunteer and be vice chair for the processing committee uh, and help create standards that would directly reflect my business uh, and the business of yeah. my clients at the time, um, <clears throat> That it was, uh, I guess it was critical for me to, you know, I guess what I preach online uh, is, you know, being a part of the change that I wanted to see in the world and really uh, yeah. take a foundational uh, kind of uh, development stance on this, where if you can like, if you can actually create these things that regulators look to create regulations from, then we can start to shape the industry in the way that we want instead of having regulators react to things and, and, and impose regulations on us. Instead, we can develop a standard, right, which is kind of nebulous, which is good to maybe clarify what a standard is within ASTM yeah, at some yeah. point here. But 
if you can create a standard that then a regulator can see came from a reputable standards development organization, say one like ASTM International with 125 years of doing this process that is uh, compliant with um, uh, World Trade Organization principles for reducing barriers to entry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they see it coming from them and they're like, oh, well, we've already adopted many other uh, ASTM international standards right. into U.S. law. Uh, this is easy to do, right? <clears throat> um, so it, it, like I said, I, I drank the Kool-Aid and I, I saw the avenue for making real fundamental change within the, the, the cannabis industry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It it definitely um, shows a very clear um, path forward of, of kind of where things are leading, where they're going. And really the um, uncertain side at this point is just kind of where it all lands um, in terms of kind of, uh, you know, the standards refinement and seeing, you know, um, kind of how that text develops. So like you're saying, if anyone listening is actually interested in all of this, um, there is opportunity to participate in this process so that when you get to the other side and these standards exist and they get adopted, um, you don't have to just sit there and complain, but you can actually say that like you were part of the process helping drive the conversations. That. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I do think we should back up a little bit and talk about, um, one, what ASTM is a little bit. You've already you know, kind of unpacked that, but, um, you know, more specifically, like, yeah, what is a standard and why does, why do it, does any of the standardization matter? That, those are great questions. So like standards are a way of, uh, they're a way of facilitating communication and discussion of topics as well as, uh, uh, allowing us to uh, bring products and commerce to actually occur. So they bring products to market and allow commerce to occur while uh, creating mechanisms that help lower regulatory burden. So what does that mean? Like, so you've already touched on one, uh, terminology. So within ASTM International, which is a, uh, again, 125 year old standards development organization, uh, so they've been around for a while, right? They've kind of, they come up with a process uh, that allows for a robust uh, kind of unbiased forum for technical experts of all shapes and sizes uh, from all over the world to come and participate in the development of uh, six, six, six types of, uh, of standards do uh, documents, right? And that's, that's terminology. So we're all speaking the same language right, about a topic so we can all understand each other critically and can discuss that in a way that allows us to, it's again, conducive for uh, both promoting uh, the marketplace, uh, but protecting consumer and environmental safety. Uh, so, and then there's uh, uh, classifications is a great example of another one. So you want to be able to create hierarchies of things, right? So you've got grade A flower and grade B flower, and you want to sell grade A for a higher price than grade B, right? Well, what makes up the, those specifications uh, yeah. that defines what grade A and grade B are? So specifications, right, are those other types of standards that allow you to really define, again, those metrics that allow you to classify goods as one thing or another. Then another type of standard that's critical, which is probably in your area, are test methods, right? Because if you don't have a <laughs> yeah. test method, you can't <clears throat> verify that something meets the specifications for it to be classified exactly. as a good and therefore allowed to be marketed, labeled, and sold as that item in the marketplace. So those suites of standards are very easy to see how those work together. And then we have a final two sets of standards, which would be guides and practices. So guides and practices allow users of these standards to comply with those, right? Or better understand their concepts. Like you might create a guide, for instance, just to help you understand the classification system that you just created. But you'd have a practice to help you comply with the specifications. So that now, you know, you've grown this amazing flower. So here's some uh, a guide to help you understand the classification system. Here's some uh, some practices to help you meet the spec, 
and you as a testing yeah. lab, right, have some test methods you can use that the marketplace can trust, right, because they were, again, developed by this organization with 125 years of history, blah, 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 <laughs> that yeah. uh, the data that comes <laughs> out of those labs, if they use these methods, right, is going to be consistent and reliable. Right, so it's 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 definitely a um, like a multifactorial um, system. Like it's it's addressing all of these these different pieces that play into um, the quality of products. Like you just said, ranging from the terminology to classifications, methods, um, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, I think that's really important to point out that standards are, uh, it can be kind of a broad term depending on how it's applied. Um, Absolutely. And ultimately it's, it's all about, exactly, yeah. And it's it's really just all about bringing everyone onto the same page to get everyone onto the same playing field essentially so that then from there we can start to understand what's going on. Um, evaluate the market a lot better, evaluate these products a lot better, and know that we're all speaking the same language. Um, and so again, I want to highlight, like this is a process among volunteers, tons of volunteers um, going through many rounds of feedback. I think sometimes people assume that governments kind of uh, come up with these standards or just arbitrarily a apply them. And I do want to, again, point out like this the government does not make these standards. These are standards produced by large groups of volunteers that are very passionate about just trying to come up with the best system possible in order to set a good stage for the industry. Um, so if anyone out there gets frustrated about standards and, you know, it's, it's important to understand that process. It, it is a welcoming public process. Um, and I'm gonna just keep reiterating that because I think it, it does need to be reiterated. And um, can you describe what are some of the issues that have come up in your meetings um, that have really risen to the top of like, these are some like really critical standards that need to be developed ASAP? Oh, great question. I really, really like that. So um, <laughs> I think there's, there are two that I am really, really happy about. Actually, I guess it's uh, really there are three that I'm super excited about. So of course, because I have roles uh, within both the D3704 on cannabis processing and handling uh, and the D3708 on cannabis devices and appliances. And I currently serve as the chief science officer for Final Bell, which is a multinational co-manufacturer. And we produce uh, uh, cannabis uh, vape products uh, and we also manufacture hardware. So. We both process and handle and create devices. So as such, right, it's really uh, important, A, again, as me as a consumer, uh, and B, as a representative of my company, to be uh, engaged in the standards development process. Um, so two amazingly awesome standards that are coming out of the O4 that we're working on right now uh, which are, I think people are going to be really excited about, is helping to create occupational health and safety uh, guidelines mm. and best practices related to dust, and specifically five kinds of dust. Uh, so, you know, we, it's not just, uh, we, we had an initial task uh, group meeting to talk about dusts, uh, and, you know, the first type of dust, of course, we're talking about is, well, People, you know, you grind, you grind flour, right? So that you can make right, pre-rolls right. and, and, or whatever, or for extraction or whatever. Right. Um, but then yep. it was like, well, you also ground the, you grind the stock so that you can make, yeah. you know, herd or, uh, whatever else, right. You, the people, true, grind true, stock yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. there's also, you grind the seed. So you're making food yep. products, right? So there's also that. And, Sometimes in cases you grind the, the whole plant, you grind everything up, right? Yep. And you also, there's a, you know, there are new things on the marketplace like crystallized cannabinoids. And these are typically, you know, grown in lattices, sheets, or larger chunks that have to be broken down by yep. grinding. So now we have dusts from, uh, you know, crystallized cannabinoids. So those are the five types of dust that we're now looking at that spawned from a discussion specifically related to grinding up just flour, 
right? And those concerns That's related cool. to that, because it's one thing to grind up clean product. Yes. But what right. happens if that product's dirty? Now you've yeah. got aerosolized particles of molds, mildews, pesticides that were on that material. So the questions start to become a lot more, more of the safety concerns start to become a lot more pressing when you're dealing with common agricultural issues, right? On, uh, right. on the plant level. So that's, that was one standard that I'm super excited about. Uh, obviously yeah, on the heels, uh, of the, um, uh, you know, the court cases that have been occurring, right. Related to dust inhalation. I was, I was facilities. just going to bring that up. Yeah. There, there are people that have gotten sick and reportedly possibly died because of exposure to dust and whatever else in some of these working conditions without proper, um, ventilation support and things like that. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, it's, this it's is critical real. and we're, it, and we're really excited to be working on these fundamental and foundational, uh, safety standards for, you know, employees for us working, you know, yes, in yeah. these buildings. Right. Um, and another one, uh, coming out of our January meeting that just happened, super exciting, uh, is, uh, a specification for the indicators for a, for determining whether or not a cannabinoid is intoxicating. So to shorten that up, right. The yeah. specifications for for what is intoxicating for right. Uh, so what mm -hmm. is an intoxicating cannabinoid? So I'm not sure if you're familiar or were aware, uh, <clears throat> but we last year published what I think is one of the most impactful standards so far, and that's a specification for a uh, international symbol for identifying consumer products containing intoxicating yeah. cannabinoids. Which, uh, this, yeah. it, which is a, uh, a, the world's first harmonized uh, uh, international labeling specification, creating a true universal symbol for yeah. identifying products containing intoxicating cannabinoids, and uh, uh, which has been dubbed the International Intoxicating Cannabinoid Product Symbol. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> and, and so um, from that, right, we've now created this definition of or a classification of a type of cannabinoid mm -hmm. without the supporting metrics behind it, right? So typically standards yeah. come from you've got a test method so you can identify <laughs> an analyte and then you can start uh, so identifying different metrices that or, or uh, um, indicators in this case that are common, which allow you to classify things, right? Which, you know, so yeah. you could test methods allow you to build specs, which allow you to build classifications typically, but we're kind of going the other way by creating a classification for an, a type of cannabinoid. And so now we're building those supporting indicators, those metrics that ones can be tested against, uh, yeah. <clears throat> because there are existing test methods in this case for, mm -hmm. uh, at least when it comes to the pharmacological indicators that we're hoping to propose as what would identify a cannabinoid as intoxicating, uh, <clears throat> that these are established test methods that can be used in order to determine if any cannabinoid is intoxicating. And the whole goal <laughs> from all of that is that we would then test Delta 9 THC in its neutral form against these mm -hmm. specifications and define ah. level one for mm -hmm. intoxication. And from here, you can then measure the level of intoxication, right? Yeah. Of other cannabinoids against this bar against level one. Right. So you always have to tether it to something. You've always got to pick a starting point to tether your measurements to. Um, so that's clever. Um, I like that. And, and is, is there any, um, I guess like receptor affinity studies driving some of that or, or you got it Ex um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, um, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but yeah, it, uh, it's basically right. Does it solicit CB1 receptor antagonism, uh, greater than I think 50% or whatever. Uh, like I said, I don't have mm -hmm. it right in front of me. I don't want to butcher, uh, the pharmacological yeah. indicators that we've, that we've, uh, are using, 
But now these don't, you know, just because they're the ones that have been proposed doesn't necessarily mean that they're correct. So the group working on it right now is in an, mm -hmm. is in an in-depth literature review to like fully elucidate all this information uh, or the yeah. potentially other indicators or pharma pharmacological indicators that are important. So that was the two from the two standards in development right That's now. Cool. Uh, from the D3708 on cannabis processing and ha sorry D3704 on cannabis processing and handling, but the one from the 08, which I well, there are there are a lot more than the one, uh, than just one, but from our January meeting again that we just had, um, uh, uh, the uh, the really important standard that spawned from that uh, discussion and effort is a specification for contamin uh, sorry for concentration limits of non-cannabinoid mm. ingredients used in the manufacture of cannabinoid products intended for vaporization so ah, okay you know there yeah. are there are many uh many types of ingredients some people might yes. argue that a terpene is an ingredient uh you know yep. and others may not but there are certainly you know, uh varying degrees of terminology, right, that can be used to describe uh, things that are incorporated into vape products, formulated extracts, etc., right, to yeah. make them function within the devices or flavor them right, or, help them flow whatever or whatever, it, whatever. or whatever it may be. So the fact of the matter exists, right, that these products are on the marketplace. And so therefore, standards need to exist to ensure consumer safety. So what sparked this was uh, actually on the 04 side, our recording secretary, who's just super amazing, happens to send me an article uh, that was published by uh, just recently um, with uh, True Terpenes and, uh, and PAX, I believe, in some in a research yeah. group, right, where they uh, announced the um, uh, cons concerns and implications of uh, ingredient concentrations uh, during of you know, of vape products, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, um, again, being a consumer, uh, I was like, this is a standard we should do for sure. We should jump yeah. on this. Uh, and we yeah. did, uh, we created that standard. We set it all up and I'm super excited to announce that we've got, uh, not only PAX and True Terpenes, the original like authors and produce uh, of that report, but also the research team that was working on that, uh, assisting myself uh, and uh, our recording secretary from uh, the D3704 uh, to help create a standard under the 08. I know lots of back and forth, but it's more of collaboration. Oh yeah, lots right? of numbers between and codes. Yeah. <laughs> lo lots of collaboration between subcommittees really is kind of what's going on there is that so processing and handling yeah. is collaborating with, uh, with devices and appliances to help create concentration limit specifications for non-cannabinoid ingredients. And there are some major players. We've got uh, two of the largest hardware manufacturers are participating. Uh, two major product uh, manufacturers are participating on that. Uh, and uh, almost every major flavoring producer in the marketplace is all collaborating on this one standard. Wow. So it's huge. And uh, actually, you, the, the news has broken here first. Uh, in respect to like how big of a deal that collaboration really is. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really great to hear that so many producers are getting on board to try to figure these things out and, um, you know, and get on the same page because vape pens, especially from my experience working in the analytical labs, especially since my beginning work in the analytical labs was kind of in the wild, wild west days um, compared to today, um, I have seen so much that scares me <laughs> when it comes to vape pens and some of the things that are added in there, or just the lack of knowledge that some producers would have about um, how they were made or what was in them. And, you know, of course, there's been some different scares over the years around vitamin E acetate, phytol, squalene, and, and squalane, um, even MCT oils and vape pens and things like that. So um, this issue of additives and vape pens is something that keeps recurring over and over and over again. 
um, in, in the news and everything like that. So it's, it's clearly an issue. And it's something that I know from the classes that I teach that most people don't know who to trust anymore when it comes to vape pens. Um, you know, it, it's the, the reputation of the entire um, sphere of vape pen manufacturers has been affected by shenanigans by, you know, um, really what's not the majority. Um, but because of those issues of, of people really not being too careful of what they are putting in these vape pens or just having a lot of ignorance when it comes to um, general safety. Maybe they were looking at safety data sheets and they were like, well, this compound says it's grass, even though they're ignoring the intended uses of that compound, which is what defines grass in the first place. Um, you know, so there's a lot of just genuine ignorance that I think comes along with it. And there is also some maliciousness by certain parties as well. Um, but I think a lot of it is ignorance and people just wanting to know what should we be doing and, and what is the right way forward. Absolutely. And that's where these standardization, these standards and standardization in general, but the standards that are being developed by the D37 really serve both the producer and the regulator, right? So yeah, yeah I talked about our six different types of standards, right? And I, I alluded to technical experts who participate. So it kind of sounds like this, you know, uh, you know, uh, good boys clubbed, all elitist, closed doored, all right, that type right. of thing. But it's not. It's like I said, it's open to anyone anywhere in the world. Um, and in fact, there are four distinctive voter classifications in order to kind of balance voting interests. So producers, manufacturers of cannabis products, right? They're on one side of the scale so that they can't influence everything, right? They, they yes. get equally yeah. balanced out by the other three types of voters that are users of these standards. So like if in your case, if you're a laboratory, a lab technician, you would use a test method. Mm -hmm. Then there are consumers like myself. I'm on the street. I'm going in. I'm going to go buy a vape cart, right? Yeah. And then there are general interests. And that's a, you know, kind of a general category that could mean that you literally could just be like, oh, I heard about this topic and I happen to vape nicotine. So uh, this might interest me. Yeah. So you're going to go join the meeting or more precisely, you know, you're a consultant or you're an academic or you are a regulator mm -hmm. or a government agent, right? You get caught, you kind of, you get rolled into this classification. Um, so yeah. those four voting blocks or member types, member classifications, uh, is what really makes the ASTM process work and allows yeah. anyone again, to participate in that process. Well, that is huge to point out. I'm so glad that you, um, unpacked that because I'm sure one of the questions someone listening would have had immediately was, Oh, okay. So all of these private companies are sitting at the table deciding how everything goes. Um, so that was really great that you threw that in when you did, because, um, yeah, these, these, there are ways to balance these things. And it's one of these things that if you don't participate and you're not involved, um, in anything like this, it's understandable that you don't know how it works. And there are, you know, generally, uh, you know, assumptions that people make about, um, a lot of these things. But again, just to highlight everything that we've pointed out here, this is, um, over a thousand people working together, collaborating, sharing ideas. Um, the, the voting system is weighted so that private companies that have interests in the standards being a certain way that they do not have that power. Um, they have a, they have some say and they can contribute, but they cannot dominate the conversation. And, um, and that there's also room at the table for people that have no experience or have no direct, um, stakeholding in it, but are maybe in adjacent industries or are somehow ancillary, um, to what's going on, you know, that they have a place too. Um, th this is just so critical to point out, um, I just think this is a lot different than how most people think that it is. Um, I agree with you that a lot of people assume that these are kind of closed door meetings. And honestly, some of that comes from the way that states have handled um, the development of regulations and rules, because 
it's not too uncommon in particular states in the United States to create these subcommittees that, you know, they sort of put out an invitation for people to join, but then the same people always end up being um, staffed on them and they generally have certain interests, you know, uh, or they're connected to politicians, whatever. And, and so that stuff does happen. And so I think it's important, one, to acknowledge that that, um, that kind of screwed up system does exist often you know, on the state level. But what we're talking about is so different. Um, is such a different process. Um, and it's a process that's really um, been tried and tested, like just the overall system. How do we engage these conversations? How do we move forward? How do we weight these votes? All that sort of stuff. Um, so again, for anyone listening that's trying to wrap your head around what's going on and who's making these decisions, when we're talking about these, you know, really we're talking about global standards. We're talking about um, thousands of people collaborating. This is very, very different than what you may have seen in your home state, for example, and how decisions get made. Yeah, and just to kind of, you know, uh, I guess to put a pin on that one, right? So it's you know, 1,400 members currently within the D37, and those are from, I think it's 36 different countries. Um, and we've been, yeah. over the past five years, have published 45 standards. Uh, which is pretty good yeah, considering wow. the, the awesome. time frames, and it's certainly right. As I was saying, with when you look from the outside in, it seems imposing. It seems closed doored. But a good example would be like so ISO, the, and the way that their mm-hmm. voting system is structured is that it's one country, one vote, which is extremely yeah. closed doored. So a country gets to elect a. Uh, subject matter expert, and that is typically a pay-to-play role. Um, someone yeah, uh, yeah. who has uh, donated or contributed to the efforts in a way that also presents uh, a subject matter expertise within the marketplace for uh, each country to participate. So very, very closed doored in that respect. Um, and then you'd have other, like more local, like you were saying, there are a lot of groups who have popped up and around, right? whether it's a trade association yeah. or a another body that's attempting to self-regulate and develop um, best practices in order to self-regulate too, there's a lot of question, right, as to the validity of the uh, yeah. product that's produced by those groups because they are, again, pay-to-play, right? And there are structured yeah. tiers based on, you know, just your basic level entry as a member to uh, which, you know, what does that get you to then those, you know, people paying tens of thousands of more, right. And can get into the Mm -hmm. closed door rooms that actually do the things and uh, steer how that committee, that organization does its things. Right. So again, it seems very uh, kind of closed off to the average person. Right. So yes, absolutely. Uh, ASTM International's process is much different than that, as you've already pointed out, where, again, anyone uh, with any just, cons- uh, well, I, I won't say it's free, but anyone with $75 can join yeah. this process. So $75 in the U.S. sounds, you know, like, you know, I can do that um, for it. And that's, you know, that's annual. But and a lot of our members and we have a... Uh, uh, a driving uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion program that we're trying to implement right now, which will create a way of facilitating more uh, stakeholder voices from places that are wow. uh, far away, hot and humid, and hard to get to, right? Um, yeah, so that yeah. we can make sure that we're representing uh, our culturally and geographically diverse cannabis industry. Yes, absolutely. Which is, I mean, uh, seeing the whole global cannabis industry explode, I think that's that's always been important, but you know, almost never so as important as right now because um, there are tons of voices getting lost along the way um, for a number of different reasons, uh, different countries, different states, different communities, different groups of people. Um, different demographics that are all a part of 
this whole complex uh, interconnected system that we call the cannabis industry. Um, and, you know, a lot of times they do get relegated to the sidelines of, you know, um, not really um, ever being um, in one invited for the first, you know, it's just right away, not invited. And then two, um, you know, having the resources and abilities to um, get involved um, that can be challenging depending on, on the person, the community, et cetera. Um, so that's awesome to hear um, because the last thing that we want is for all of these standards and directions to get decided and then um, realize that there's been these gross oversights that are negatively impacting um, very important stakeholders in the industry. Um, so that's great. That's super awesome. I, and I, this kind of leads to my next question I was going to ask, which is what uh, what is ASTM as far as, you know, focusing on the cannabis side? What is the the future looking like? What are the the topics, concepts, um, and things that you're sort of looking at, uh, towards the future that once you, um, address what you're currently working on that, you know, is, is likely to be on the horizon. Great question. Actually, uh, the D37 committee just formed a, an official steering committee, uh, or strategic nice. planning committee. And its, its purpose, its job, its scope is to create a five-year standards development plan uh, not to, and, uh, and to continuously develop and improve upon that plan. Um, uh, yeah. And so, and to kind of do an audit and assessment of the committee's work and help guide uh, the committee in, in its progress going forward. So we're kind of currently in the process of figuring out what the next five years is going to look like, which is all the more reason yeah. why it's uber critical for people to really participate, right? So, yeah, this is never the time. before do you have an opportunity to build upon the momentum that a group has built over the last five years and then contribute by throwing your dart against the wall when it comes to your, you know, your topic, your concern, your point of interest in the marketplace that's really. Uh, um, grinding your gears, right, or whatever it might yeah, be, yeah, um, and so that you can have that heard and then wade, you know. So because I'm within the 04 and the 08, and I'm helping to run how we're doing that, right? We're basically holding a, a, a bunch of meetings where we're having our members propose a whole bunch of ideas that we are just, you know, tracking every single one, trying to get them to give us at least. A skeleton of a title because it's really important to know kind of what you're talking about and then you know brief rationale right. brief scope brief just like hey it's gonna do this right and that way it's easier for us as members to then uh rank these on a very simple numbering scale for priority level that way we can then put the ones that scored as you know high priority up at the top of the list etc and then can hopefully nice, yeah. get, you know, push and prod and convince our, uh, get a volunteer member to then take up the charge on those uh, highest priority standards. Uh, an example of some of this stuff, right, that uh, 04 threw against the wall so far, uh, which yeah. actually stuck and got some, some, some major interest is in the topic of compressed liquid petroleum gases. So, you know, um, yeah, compressed okay. gas cylinders mm -hmm. um, and uh, LGB uh, hydrocarbons you know, in protein, uh, <laughs> uh, in butane, <laughs> uh, iso isopropane, uh, and, uh, um, and et cetera. My apologies. Um, it's early in the morning. No, that was, that was a good Coast, slip up. Right? I like that. In protein. Um, <laughs> um, Need specifications, right, for what is a absolutely uh, a, a, an appropriate grade, or uh, yes. for performing an herbal extraction that's intended for inhalation, as well as and that's the key. Let's 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 point out what you just said. Um, that's intended for inhalation because a lot of people say like, well, these gases have been used for extraction for all these plants for all this time. However, people are not smoking those extracts. They're not vaping those extracts. Um, so I just wanted, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just really wanted to emphasize that point 
that it's about these quality standards in the context of inhalation, uh, which is a big difference. Quality has to be higher with inhalation because you're bypassing your innate mechanisms to filter toxins. So just just wanted to emphasize that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I felt like that was really no, important that's, to point out. That's why it's like why I stressed helping the members create a title. Because it's you know yeah. you could make you could make that title pretty vague and just say we're going to do specifications for uh, compressed gases for uh, and, you know for extraction grade uh, compressed gases right, but you yeah. know, that covers a lot of topics versus you know uh, yeah. ones specifically intended for uh, um, uh, inhalation right for and inhalation. then others as yeah. you just mentioned for ingestion right so. Those, uh, those, those, those stuck against the wall, and we had some major ga uh, gas producers. You know, not the actual manufacturers of the gas who produce the and supply everyone else were like, "Yep, we're gonna create those specifications," which was huge. Yeah, um, yeah. But we also had, uh, you know, throwing against the wall, right? Just really quickly, um, cleaning practices for those cylinders because. <laughs> yes. uh, as they're, you know, going through rotation, you know, what's going on inside them? Well, we need to be able to clean them well. Well, you can't clean them well unless you have what? Specifications for what is quote unquote clean, right? Or clean. Yeah. what, what yeah. You know, basically what are the specifications for um, uh, a decontaminated cylinder, right? And yeah. none of those matter unless you have what? Test methods so that you can verify that, again, going back to the gas, that it meets the specifications that uh, it yep. is indeed in, uh, appropriate for creating an extract intended for inhalation. So I'm going to use, right. I can, I can use, I can be confident my QA manager, right. Who's uh, checking everything mm -hmm. and on the supplies can go, yes, I'm going to approve this batch of gas. Right. Um, and they can be confident in doing so, but that test method also to verify when you're on, when you're on the, uh, cylinder cleaning side that you've now actually performed an adequate uh, uh, cleaning, correct, right? So those are just uh, an assortment that stuck against the wall and got the gas industry super excited and working on standards yeah. for the, the D3704. Um, uh, so we've got, you know, uh, outside industries now who are paying a lot more attention to what we've got going on. Um, but yeah, we've got a, we've got a lot of stuff uh, like literally I quite honestly, Jason, I should have had my list ready. So I could have been like, it's you'd be like, bam, these are just under O4 well, and if you, 08. If you right? do we've have a list, I can, throw it. I can in, throw it in the show uh, notes. <laughs> I'd have to, uh, I'd have to really compile that for you, but yeah, let's do it. I mean, for I'm everyone happy to, to do kind it. of see, yeah, there, show are, everybody. there are many work items in progress and uh, as I said, we're developing our, our future timeline. What are we going to do over the next five years? No better time to participate than now. Yeah, no, this is, this is really, really exciting. And something I'll point out too, you know, I do a lot of consulting with um, producers that are trying to be GMP compliant and trying to understand what GMP means, at least in the FDA context or um, European, depending on where you are. Um, but one thing that I point out is like, well, you've got to have specifications for all these things. What does it mean for something to be clean? How do you verify that things have been cleaned? How do you verify this, that, or the other? And something I want to point out is that once these uh, standards are established, um, well, one, I'll say in the absence of standards, you have to define all these things yourself. Um, those of you that think you're getting away with being not compliant with GMP all of this time, it will catch up with you eventually if you operate long enough and you're supposed to have all of these specifications defined in some way. Um, and 99% of producers do not define these specs at all. They just, you know, it's kind of a, um, everyone just kind of knows what they're supposed to do and they eyeball it and they might have SOPs, but they're usually pretty um, vague. And so when all of these specifications are defined, it's actually going to make it way simpler and without a lot of folks even realizing it, it's going to save them a ton of time, energy, and money um, because they will not have to make up these specifications themselves. They can just defer to something that's already established. So I want to point that out. Those of you that are pursuing GMP compliance, pay attention to these standards. Um, they will make your life 
so much easier when you get into the thick of it, when you're actually trying to prepare for an FDA audit, um, you know, or depending on if you're another country, there are all sorts of other different governing bodies that do similar work. Um, you know, when you're actually taking that seriously and getting ready, you're going to appreciate these standards so much. It will literally save your company tens of thousands of dollars in just spent time and energy um, in labor, just trying to get your quality systems buttoned up with the specifications you need to defend all of your data. So I know we're coming up on the hour. I need to let you go. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. But this has been an awesome conversation. Like I said, I knew the hour would fly by. I have a feeling we have more conversations that we need to go through because there's still more to unpack. We've only just really talked about labeling and a little bit about Scratch processing. The and there's so, yeah, we've really scratched the surface. So um, I won't keep you up. I want to be respectful of your time. But um, Darwin, thanks so yeah. much for spending the hour with me. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm stoked that our, of our paths have crossed. I'm really, I'm really stoked to know you. Absolutely, Jason. I just wanted to echo what you were saying before that um, not only will in the uh, using these standards, the guides and practices to help you comply with the specifications and the, in the end, the regulations will absolutely help you save time and money. That's yeah. key to helping you in the transition period. Yep. Uh, but what it's really, really important is that, and as you're mentioning, and I just want to kind of call uh, circle back to your yeah, uh, yeah. original comments about that, you know, people find them as burdensome, right? Trying yeah. to uh, comply with these standards, these specifications, these regulations related to GMP, et cetera, right? While it is true that the transition is certainly burdensome, once you're there and you've put yeah. these specifications in place and you have ch uh, checks, uh, your uh, document control practices in place, you have your uh, process validations in place, things get a lot easier and yes, you have built absolutely. in risk mitigation within the com uh, within your operation so in the long run it is substantially cheaper to perform in a complying manner uh, according to gmp based on your entity's risk assessment uh mm -hmm. than it is to uh than it is to basically try to uh wing it without any types of controls because with these controls and with standards and specifications and these other types of guides and practices, you can help better uh, determine KPIs, your key performance indicators yeah. within your operation and can help drive efficiencies and uh, not only improve bottom line, but start improving uh, company culture as well as you know, your brand yes, repre yes. Uh, reputation within marketplace. There are tons yeah. of value adds that are looked at currently, right? Because our marketplace was kind of in the U.S. Unfortunately, designed with quality, uh, uh, product quality, and consumer safety uh, last, and diversion yeah. first, right? Diversion control yeah. and fear and mitigation uh, first, of right? Um, Lead with fear, and, yeah. And and because of that, we kind of dropped that ball. And now it's like, hey, industry didn't have to operate according to any standards. What are you talking about? We should we should now continue to have, to be in a weird bubble and just like make products that are consuming at your own risk. As right. a consumer, right. I'm I'm not good with that. So uh, <laughs> I guess that's a great place to leave it. And I'm I look forward to having a continued conversation you know, about. You know, more specifically, the our awesome new label specifications that we have coming out, which will absolutely yeah. start alleviating some of these concerns of the regulators, right? The FDA recently came yep. out again, basically saying no CBD, blah, blah, blah. But one of the big right. things they said But also, that, we well, don't we want to do anything either. <laughs> right. But what they're saying is that, well, we can't trust what's on the label, right? And what's being – these claims that are being made. Well, that's a key aspect yeah. of the label specification that will help provide clarity for these regulators, right, to help, you know, yep. uh, allow these products to be sold in the marketplace. So um, I'm super excited for our next conversation. Uh, Jason, again, thank you so Absolutely. much for having me here. Um, and I guess with that, just with everybody, um, live long and process. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get notified of more videos. 
and go ahead and check out another video while you're at it.